Professor Hafizi will be enlightening us about the most relevant question that is navigating through different protocols. Um, Professor Hafizi, please. Thank you very much. So, navigating through the sea of protocols is the title I've chosen because um, this is something I'm facing almost every day and I'm sure that you are facing too whenever you have to take a clinical decision on your keratoconus patients. These are my financial obligations. Now the background is everything we do should follow some guidelines, some internal or external guidelines. The guidelines mean that you should be able to plot whatever you do into theoretically this one here, mentally. Is there clinical evidence for what you're doing? Is there experimental evidence for, for what you're doing? And the method you're applying, does it have one of them or both, which would be ideal, or does it lack any of them? And you know and I know that there are some of these methods out there that have neither clinical nor lab evidence. You might still apply them on your own risk, but at least you should be absolutely clear for yourself when you apply them. Which means that plotting all these different techniques that have emerged over the past years into that scheme is something I'm doing on a regular basis and this is my own personal scheme. Feel free to adapt it, do your own and you might agree on some of them, you might not agree on others, but this is what I do for myself maybe two or three times a year. So I check what has evidence, what has came up in the past months, where am I comfortable applying a technique and where am I not. And again, don't look at the glossy brochures, look at the hard facts. Now, hard facts mean understanding the factors that go along with the methods. One essential element in this reaction is oxygen. And if you understand the way oxygen works, then you understand why some techniques work better than others, and you also understand how to concretely apply them in your patients. Looking at oxygen, keep these two things in mind and the rest of the techniques will be easier to understand. Whenever you switch light on, you deplete your oxygen within the corneal stroma within seconds and it needs minutes to come back up again. That's factor one. And the other factor is the epithelium drinks oxygen. It needs a lot of oxygen, ten times more than the stroma. This is basic textbook physiologies from the early 70s. So when you don't have, when you have an intact epithelium, then you have a huge barrier for the oxygen to penetrate and the little oxygen that penetrates gets eaten up before it even gets into the stroma. So limited amounts of oxygen present in the corneal stroma when there is intact epithelium. We checked this in a very simple experiment a few years ago by performing cross-linking under an oxygen-free atmosphere. That's a plexiglass hood flooded with helium. Now, doing this, we see that there is no redundancy in the system, and that's important. No redundancy. No oxygen, that's the circle on the right, means zero reaction. And oxygen present means the typical increase that we all know about in biomechanical stiffness. Now, keeping this in mind, you will see how this applies to accelerated, it applies to epion, it applies to pulse and also contact lens assisted cross-linking. But what are the implications for your daily practice? Let's look at accelerated. Knowing about this, we know that the scheme that we are all using, the scheme here, the bunsen rosco law, is a simplification. You cannot simply say that as long as I keep my overall energy the same, it'll work out nicely. You cannot say that accelerating a method three times by, by triplicating the energy will turn out in the same way clinically. So keeping this in mind, where is the biological cutoff? The biological cutoff already starts at 9 milliwatts. We've published these data some years ago in IOVS, and the yellow bar is the Dresden protocol, 30 minutes, and it has the strongest increase in biomechanics. Nine milliwatts for 10 minutes are already worse, significantly worse. But again, now I'm wearing my, my experimental hat. As a clinician, I'm using the red column 
in my adult patients. Because 9 milliwatts for 10 minutes, the red column, clinically is sufficient in many cases of very slowly progressive cone in a 30-year-old, let's say. But whenever I'm facing an aggressive state, children, ectasia after uh, refractive laser surgery, whenever I'm facing this, I'm going back to the blue scheme. Although, although most papers show that 9 milliwatts is similar to uh, 3 milliwatts, again, if I look at the hard lab evidence, it gives me even, an even better level of confidence that I'm able to stop the disease. This is the beauty of technology. Now it's not moving forward. Let's see. Could you try one more time? Press the, the right, yeah. Here we go. Which means that, let me see whether it works from my end now. Which means that looking at the clinical evidence, it seems to support this. The upper paper, for example, is one of many that uses 9 milliwatts with good results. If you go to 18 milliwatts, mm, mixed results. Some work, others don't. We might be there in a few years where we can simply adapt the speed of treatment to the aggressiveness of the ectasia, but for now we are not. So what I am using... Thank you, Brad. What I'm using is this roster. I stay with nine for most of my cases, and I do not go to 18 for now, and I certainly do not go above 18. Now, going to Epion. Epion, please remember the 10 times, 10 times the epithelial consumption of the epithelium and 10 times less concentration available in the stroma, which means that oxygen becomes a limiting factor. You can do epi on and have lots of riboflavin in your cornea by any means, by applying drops, by an active transport like iontophoresis, still oxygen limits the effectiveness of the treatment, which we have shown also a few years ago. Does that mean that I don't use epi on clinically? No, I do use it, but I'm very aware of the reduced efficacy. I don't use it in standard cases, but I do use it in cases where the compliance of the patient is low. So if I'm facing a nine-year-old child with a mental deficit that has a huge risk of post-operative eye rubbing, then yes, I go to Epion because I, I personally judge for this one patient that the benefit of reduced infection risk is higher than the loss of efficacy. Because we go down to 60 to 70 percent of efficacy in Epion. But if I have to do an, an even bilateral Epion on the general anesthesia in a Down syndrome kid of eight years, yes, I go to Epion. Just keep in mind and understand what you're doing when to be on the safest side possible. Now, pulsed. Pulsed simply means that instead of applying a continuous form of light, you applied fractionated. This was an answer of industry to the oxygen story. They said, oh, if oxygen plays a role, then let's just switch off the light for a defined amount of time during the time oxygen rediffuses. This sounds so nice, and what you see in blue is the protocol that has been proposed by industry. What you see in red is actual physiology. So if you were to apply this, you would need almost three hours for the reaction to occur. Now, what industry is trying now is to apply an increased, um, an increased uh, partial coefficient of oxygen over the cornea to improve this reaction. Let's wait and see, but I must say I'm not impressed doing this in eight minutes with pulse light instead of 10 minutes with continuous light with my old lamp, and it works just fine. If you look at the data, and again here just for, for explanations, if this is basic physiology, and if you stop the reaction here by applying light on and off and pulsed, then all you would end up, which is the blue dots, is a very low level of oxygen. Keeping this in mind, we, we checked this. The upper is a publication uh, for, in the laboratory, so ex vivo, and we've seen that pulse works. It works nicely 
but not at all better than continuous light for 10 minutes. So the 9 milliwatt protocol is just as good as the pulsed protocol in our hands, and we've also verified this clinically. Similar results in the pulsed protocol without oxygen when compared to the continuous. So no, so no improvement. Oh, the last one is contact lens assisted. This is a, a very clever idea of our friend Susan Jacob. She published the technique some years ago, and the contact lens virtually increases the thickness of the cornea. But keep in mind two things. Uh, first of all, we rechecked what she has done in, um, in uh, the lab, and we first had, and we invited Susan and Amar onto the paper, and, and the first series of experiments we did had almost 40% less effectiveness biomechanically. And we were using the contact lens that was described in the original paper, and then we realized, oh, this contact lens has a low oxygen diffusion coefficient. So we cho chose another lens, and then the diffusion coefficient was better, and the effectiveness increased. This is nice, but it still didn't increase to normal levels. Why? Well, simply, instead of cross-linking a cornea, you cross-link a contact lens plus cornea. And some of the effect is just lost in the contact lens, yeah, because, because the superficial layers of whatever you cross-link will be cross-linked more than the deep ones. Knowing this, I think contact lens assisted cross-linking was a good intermediate technique, but where we need to go to in, in last consequence is individualizing the fluence. That's the best way to go in my eyes, which means that for the past 15 years, what we have done is on the left, we have a 400 micron cornea, and we apply riboflavin, we do the cross-linking procedure, and then the effect goes down to 60, 70 microns to the endothelium, just to protect the endothelium. Now, when we are facing a 300 micron cornea, we are potentially in trouble because our energy would hit the endothelium, so what we do is we somehow increase thickness by swelling the cornea, and all of you who have tried swelling, the hypoosmolaric one that we introduced 10 years ago, you know that it sometimes works nicely, and other, time, other times it doesn't really swell at all, it's very volatile. So is there any other means to overcome this issue? And we think there is. We have to individualize the fluids, which means on the left is the Dresden protocol, or better, the 5.4 joule, and then we just adapt the fluids to every thickness. And by doing so, we need to understand, we need to understand how many minutes we need to apply for any given intensity. This algorithm has been created by us and published almost three years ago, and we have clinical data with a two-year follow-up that we will present at ESCRS this year. This is one of the cases, and the, as you can see here, the demarcation line is a, 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 at a nice depth and stops before the endothelium, and this was a 360 micron cornea. No swelling, no contact lens, just adapting the energy. So we have 56 eyes for, uh, so far. The thinnest we have cross linked was 245 microns. What we have done outside the study, and these data will, present it, will be presented at ESCRS, what is interesting is the success rate still is quite high. I was not expecting 85%. I was expecting maybe 70 or 75, because these are extremely thin corneas. But uh, another nice anecdote is we were able to cross link two cases with keratoglobus and the thinnest one was 205, and they are stable so far. So this might open up alleys for the treatment of extremely thin disease. The data will be presented at ESCRS, and hopefully, oh, that's the last series of slides I just added this morning. The last question is, looking into the sea of protocols, when should you retreat your patients? When is the time to think about a second cross-linking procedure? Well, first of all, if you just memorize um, your internal scheme. You cross-link a patient, then you wait usually half a year to see whether you had success by stabilizing, whether you had success by even flattening the cornea, or whether the cornea continues decompensating. And then, of course, you would cross-link. That's, that's the early intervention. But what about cross-linking after two, three, or four years? Keep two things in mind. The collagen turnover 
is approximately six to eight years. So when I cross-link you today, in eight years, there is no more cross-linked collagen in your cornea. But you have aged by eight years, and age also increases biomechanics. Keeping this in mind, let's just play out two scenarios. If I cross-link, this is the effect of age, the natural effect. If I cross-link a patient at 27, and then I wait for um, eight years, then the effect of cross-linking will slowly fade, but the patient will be 35, 6 or 7, so most likely stable due to age. What happens if you cross-link the same patient, the, the same type of ectasia, in a 12-year-old? How old is the 12-year-old after eight years? 20. Most likely, this patient will progress. So keep in mind that we should, sh the younger our patients are, the more likely the, the, the need for recross-linking after some years. We have been looking at our 10-year data together with Theo, and we have not enough patients in the follow-up to, to see a clear significance, but we see a trend. The younger the patients are at the time of primary cross-linking, the more likely the decompensation at a later stage, which simply makes sense. This is our lab at Zurich University. And we would all like to invite you to the Crosslinking Congress that will take place in December of this year. And you will recognize many of the faces of the faculty which are, who are present here today. Thank you for your attention.